Good afternoon, I'm Derek Cribley. I'm the director of our systems engineering group uh, at Bastion Solutions. And I'm here with a couple other Bastion colleagues to discuss mobile robotic shuttles and how they're extending beyond the storage buffer. I've already introduced myself, but we also have Kevin Darby, who's one of our national account managers, and Joe Zogzogi, who that's I think I pronounced it right. He told me he would nod if I didn't, but uh, uh, who's our mobile robotics manager. And uh, collectively, we have a lot of experience with this type of technology, and we're excited to be able to talk with you today about that. Uh, first, we're going to start with a little bit of history and what's kind of brought us to the current technology and where we see the future going, uh, what's enabling some of those uh, technologies to be enabled, both the technologies that are available and uh, what we see in the industry with regards to what our customers are requiring. Some of the applications that they're beneficial in, uh, where we've put them in thus far, uh, talk about the benefits and finally about how to justify them. So first uh, we're going to kick off with a little bit about the history. and. Uh, this isn't meant to be an all-inclusive history of, of shuttles or anything of that nature, quite frankly. But I kind of wanted to uh, set the stage for where we're, we believe we're going to be heading here. So the first uh, start with that uh, we kind of grouped our shuttle systems in, or we call it contained shuttle systems. So um, I kind of saw this as like what I would call maybe the first generation and the second generation shuttle systems. These, uh, the robotic vehicle or shuttle is uh, contained within the aisle and uh, not freely moving outside of the aisles. So uh, this has been a very successful and has certainly set the stage for what is to come. Uh, usually used in goods to person applications, um, also uh, for case buffering applications. Uh, some of the um, advantages of the second generation system is that um, we've been able to improve reliability and uh, scalability where you're having a shuttle that can interact with multiple aisles or uh, cover more than one, one aisle, for instance, or one level. Some of the uh, systems currently in place now are uh, made by uh, suppliers such as like the multi-shuttle, the OSR, the perfect pick, and the uh, auto store. So uh, the next generation, uh, I call it the third generation of our mobile shuttle systems, are ones that are mobile. So they're able to leave uh, from the storage buffer and the automated storage system and interact with other parts of the uh, operations. So uh, really this uh, mobility is uh, providing performance improvements that uh, allow it, the shuttle to do more than just provide uh, automated storage and retrieval system functionalities. Uh, we are insta currently installing some of these third generation uh, systems in the United States currently. Uh, and couple, quite a few of them have been installed uh, worldwide already. So to help us uh, also talk about the history and where we're heading, uh, we need to also talk about automated guided vehicles. So uh, this is kind of like a sister path to the shuttle. They've actually been around quite a bit longer. Um, and I think some of the first automated uh, guided vehicles uh, were in play before I got in the material handling industry. But uh, really the next generation or the advanced uh, automated guided vehicles um, are doing more than what the traditional vehicle did where it was a point to point transportation system. These uh, automated guide vehicles are working hand in hand with people. So uh, they have increased levels of safety, uh, improved sens uh, sensors, and are able to kind of augment what the people are doing. Uh, they're also flexible. Uh, this latest uh, vehicle has got a lot more uh, agility, as you can see. They're able to crab or rotate about themselves as opposed to uh, maybe a, trad a traditional forklift type equipment. And they have a variety of payloads and uh, type of applications in use, including a goods to person. 
So also to help us uh, talk about where the trends are heading, uh, we need to talk a little bit about robotic picking. Uh, this has really picked up in the past few years where instead of bringing the goods, uh, the shuttle system bringing the goods out to a person to interact and pick the product out of a bin, for example, a robot is able to provide that functionality. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, some other uh, trends, including the improvements in vision uh, and 3D mapping that allow the, um, the robot to pick items directly out of a bin. So this is, uh, this is the precursor to the future here. These, these are some of the newer vehicles that we're seeing. It's really a combination of a shuttle or automated guided vehicle working with a robot on board. So uh, this is, I'd call the holy grail of uh, mobile robotics. This is a, a robot to goods application rather than a goods to robot application. And we think this is, uh, this is very beneficial in that you can deploy multiple of these uh, robots out to uh, perform the work. And uh, so as a result, it's very scalable. Uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit more about this in some of the future slides here. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Kevin to talk about uh, some of the enabling trends. OK, thanks. So as Derek said, there's um, sort of we had this evolution of mobile shuttles, but what's driving it? And we see uh, the trends that are driving it are kind of twofold. One is sort of the industry or culture as we have it. We're sort of getting to individual things. We have a lot of desire to have a custom of products delivered to us. And then uh, along with that trend is the ability for technology to sort of come alongside of that. And we're seeing these two things kind of merge together. Enabling this, uh, one of the first things is sort of just labor. Uh, anyone who's been in the industry, uh, warehousing industry know labor is a critical part of it and it's getting very expensive, uh, not just from like, you know, the, here on the minimum wage, uh, but also just in terms of training people, having people constantly uh, turn over and you're having different issues and you kind of also need a more qualified many times when you have these more advanced systems uh, labor and that's getting harder to find. Uh, then you have, uh, as we can see here with some of these large, this slide, some of the large retailers, they do massive amounts of seasonality. Well, when you have seasonality, you magnify your issue with labor because you have to bring people in, you got to train them, they're maybe not doing the greatest job because they're new, it's something they're not familiar with, and so they make mistakes or they are slower than the, the, the workers that you have. Um, in the same way that you have the same problems with turnover, um, with the turnover people, you have um, to train them, you have to constantly train. I remember I was working with a beer distributor and we were talking about, um, he was giving away keys to his, to, or he hadn't given away keys, but he was creating all the keys for the people in his uh, warehouse and he had generated like 900 keys over like a three and a half year period because he had gone through so many people in the warehouse. And it was a lot of it had to do with how much weight they were picking up and a lot of safety issues that are coming up and it generates for a lot of turnover. Then you have on the side of sort of like where is the industry, where is our society going? And obviously the e-commerce is a huge factor in this. And uh, with e-commerce, your orders are much more complex. Instead of sending to a single store where you're putting everything on a pallet and you're putting 50 of it or if you make a mistake and it goes out to the store, it comes back to you, it's not that big of a deal. You make a mistake uh, when you send something out in e-commerce, you know, that's a lot of money that you have to have back. You have unhappy customers. Um, obviously, the high SKU counts as you're getting now in warehouses, warehouses are becoming the stores. Uh, um, and so they want to hold everything. And all you have to do is add another page to your website and you have another product, but you got to put it somewhere. Um, obviously, it makes larger warehouses a lot more uh, room to run around and makes people less efficient. But even within sort of the more traditional methods of distribution, you're seeing the effect of this sort of individuality or sort of customization of products. Um, again, using a beverage analogy, um, I've worked a lot with uh, soda distributors. And 15, 20 years ago, they might have like 150, 200 SKUs. Today, they have minimum of 800 to 1,000 SKUs. They can have stores ordering hundreds of different SKUs. That adds a lot of complexity and a lot of issues that you have to make sure 
and then obviously kitting parts, putting things together as well as part of the whole process of not only are a lot of people selling stuff, but they're also putting it together just in time. And that used to be done at the warehouse or at the production facility. Now it's being done at warehouses. And so all of these things coming together are really driving the need for this mobile robot that can do picking and it can be automated. And Joe's going to speak to us about what are the technologies um, that are going to, and this last slide sort of speaks to, I guess I would highlight to say that it kind of, when the, cut, when the end users are pushing for a technology, I think it's a real indicator that you really, there's something real, a real desire for something. And this is just a highlight, Amazon did a challenge to do automatic picking. And so I think that highlights really where the industry is going. There you go. Well, just like any mechanism, robots consume energy. And the main challenge with mobile robots is to pack enough energy on board, at the same time provide enough power to move things around. And uh, you can certainly recognize how much attention this is getting through the, uh, through the industry development on batteries and how that is moving uh, so fast in terms of higher energy density, lighter weight, more power, higher life cycle. And uh, a perfect example is lithium ion batteries and lithium polymer batteries. I was walking around today and I recognized that Certain batteries now can go for 4,500 cycles. And so this is, this is great, this is perfect. You are trying always to push the limits of the robot and uh, you need to provide enough energy and power to it. And uh, so a lot of these batteries also have no more memory effect where you don't have to worry about that. And uh, I can move on also to capacitors where manufacturers are now using nanotechnology to really pack more energy into supercapacitors and they call them ultracapacitors. And the nice thing about these ultracapacitors is that you can charge them, discharge them in a matter of seconds. And to put things in perspective, I can charge safely an ultracapacitor uh, 2,000 amps. I'm gonna try to do it ne next week, I can let you know how that goes, but according to the manufacturer, this is safe enough. And uh, what this really gives you is, you can get millions of cycles out of ultracapacitors. You can do on-the-fly charging. You don't have to bench your vehicle, have it sit for hours to charge a battery. You can collect energy as you go, and you can use regenerative energy at the same time to capture some of that and improve your efficiency. Other systems that are helping with the enabling trends are navigation systems, and specifically sensors and sensor technology. Getting more accurate uh, sensors from LIDARs to ultrasound to any kind of positioning sensor and RFIDs and all that with, combined with 3D vision, you get faster readings, more accurate, more precise, and that really gives you uh, the tools to do navigation and obstacle avoidance safely. And that enables really having multiple number of these robots working together to reach your throughput rates. And of arm tooling. Now, as, as we mentioned before, we're also looking at goods to robot applications. And in certain cases, we have six axis robot mounted on AGVs or mobile robot. And uh, really, you need to have tools to pick up multiple number of SKUs or multiple sizes or objects. And for example, here you see these robots able to pick objects of different sizes and shapes. And this type of application makes goods to robot a more feasible solution and more attractive solution to reach your throughput rates. Now to solve complex problems, especially if you have a complicated system, you need a powerful software and powerful controller. And singular controllers, think of it as a very powerful brain, super brain that can control multiple arms, it can control different aspects in your system from wheels to motion control to servo drives to gantry system and any mechatronic solution you can think of, including sensors. And so what that gives you is a powerful system, powerful controller capable of controlling different things at the same time. It gives you a coordinated and seamless motion of your system at the same time. 
Another topic that's been uh, picking up a lot of traction and speed here is open source software. And specifically, I'll talk about uh, robot operating system. This is a very, very flexible and scalable solution. And it allows you to have one software and that can control and communicate to different types of arms, let's say, or robot arms, manufacturers that produce different system types. All you have to do is have drivers for it and connect it. And at the same time, it gives you tools to do navigation, path planning, communication, also simulation and hardware integration. Well, the cost of technology, as you probably recognize, is getting cheaper. And to put things in perspective, a battery costs now maybe half of what it used to cost five years ago. And in five years, it will cost half of what's costing now. At the same time, it's packing twice as much energy. And what that gives you is a justification to use automation and robots. robots. And also, of course, you can talk about all the sensors that are getting cheaper and smaller. Technology is getting cheaper, so you can actually get your shorter payback periods and you also in increase your profitability on your system. Well, I talked a little bit about sensors and positioning sensors, but you can also use a multiple number of sensors and integrate them together to get a very reliable safety system where that, if combined with the safety standards, you can have your AGVs or your vehicle and your mobile robots able to avoid obstacles safely and work with humans as well. This is a typical mobile robot shuttle system. Um, what, what we're trying to see a, show you here is this is a robot that has, let's say, supercapacitors or the most advanced batteries powering it, and you also use ROS to do the navigation and the sensor integration. At the same time, you have your singular controller capable of moving your wheels, your gantry, your picking arms, and your end of arm tool all at the same time, and you get the synchronized motion of your vehicle, and it, it gives you really the edge to get those cycle times that you need to, to, to meet your uh, throughput rates. And one thing I wanted to mention here is what, what, differ, what makes this different from other systems is that you're doing batch picking. You're not picking one each, you're picking a batch of objects, batch, batch of products. At the same time, you're filling a multiple number of orders. Here in the case here, you see 16 totes. So what we're doing is you're trying, you drive a robot, you're picking, you're filling 16 orders at the time, and then you can have a multiple number of, of these robots working together to give you the throughput rates again that you desire. I'll pass the to me. mic to, Back to me. Yeah. <laughs> now that we've talked about the trends, uh, we wanted to give you some examples or applications of how we see this. And the first, we wanted to split it up into two, sort of two groups. Um, one was for like sort of established applications, systems we've done. Uh, that we've seen, and then uh, applications we see coming down the pike we're developing or they're emerging applications. Um, so this first one, uh, going back to my trends from before, is kind of a classic e-commerce sort of situation. You have a huge number of SKUs, you have a large inventory, and you want to consolidate into a small space. And so we use these uh, the robots on top of the grid to pick, and so you got a lot of high density, you had a lot of throughput, you have availability to a lot of pick locations, uh, and obviously you cut down on the mistakes because everything's brought to one person where they can scan it and make sure that it's confirmed and it's correct. This uh, next one of, is also pretty much is an e-commerce, but it's slightly different. And I guess what I wanted to highlight with the difference between these two is, again, this particular application had a lot of SKUs, but it didn't have the inventory. It didn't have a huge inventory. It was more one-offs one of every item. And so therefore, we could have the robots uh, more in a captured uh, aisle. And that was a better application and a better fit with the technology. And again, as you think, as we look at mobile shuttles, you want to make sure you have the right fit, the right technology to what you're doing. As I kind of go through these, you'll see different sort of flavors to it. Then, um, as Eric alluded, sort of the third generation, 
of these vehicles is moving outside of the racking system or the storage system. So here you have actually in the bottom right is where you have a storage system and then you have the vehicles actually running out and they're running onto a track. And you can basically form that track in any way you want. You can change it around. It creates a lot of flexibility to get the product to different places uh, in a very timely manner. Uh, but yet you get that storage, that density of storage you get with the other, the other applications. Then sort of the emerging, where do we see this emerging? We see it when you, you combine those things, as Derek said earlier, where you take the shuttle and you put the robot on it. And in this particular application, you're kind of seeing some uh, kitty where it's got a small number of parts and it's kind of putting all the, the different sequence or the packages together. Uh, one thing that's been highlighted, I think that's really interesting with this is um, if you made that vehicle large enough, you could have four or five boxes on it and you could do the actual picking or the kitting as it's moving. So you know, you're not wasting any time, you're not losing any time as you're doing the picking process. Uh, this next one is, a, is with, with, what Joe was showing you earlier and what I want to highlight is this one, um, we did have a high number of SKUs and so you, um, but we had a very high throughput and so that's where the batch picking came in. So you have it so that that robot's going to pick off that carton flow boxes or uh, different items out of the carton flow and then put it into each one of those bins for an order and that's going to give you that throughput and you don't have to go multiple times to the same location. You can go once and pick up the 16 different orders. And then the last example, or one of the last examples is this is a lot of SKUs, um, but also throughput. And this is an example of a wine and spirits sort of concept where they're picking their bottles and they'd pick it out of racking and the vehicle would go down the specialized rack and pick all the bottles out and fulfill the orders by doing that. And therefore you were allowed to get to a lot of SKUs, not the limited number you would see in the carton flow. And then uh, this particular application is showing, I think, sort of the, the potential for picking up heavies or large items um, and also working in a traditional setting where you're using standard rack that you've, you have. You don't have to do a lot of modification to your facility and you can use this to go and pick right off the shelf, but it's going to assist people and sort of get that, that weight that they have to pick up down. And so those are really sort of the different um, applications and sort of uses of this technology as we see it moving forward. And Joe's going to come back and talk about the benefits of that. So one of the benefits of using mobile shuttles and mobile robots is labor optimization. You allow your employees to focus on operational improvements rather than on focusing on tasks that are basic and require no skills. So. Uh, what you end up doing, you create higher paying jobs that also are safer, which in turn minimizes your turnover, the employee turnover, and also creates higher accuracy in your older fulfillment and higher precision and more reliable solution. Another benefit is space utilization. You can pack more items in your warehouse and you can eliminate large monuments, for example, aisles and racks that don't need, don't need to be there. You don't need to have people walking in there. You don't need to have forklift passing from there. So what you do is you condense your, you can, you can condense your warehouse to store more and that gives you additional benefits there. Um, energy saving, well, all these mobile robots are designed with energy optimization in mind. So what we're doing, we're always optimizing when these vehicles are operating. You can simply charge them at certain times of the day where the kilowatt hours are cheapest. You can also have them um, use regenerative energy to conserve and have more efficient uh, system. And at the same time, you don't have to power your whole system, your whole warehouse at once. You power specific robots just to meet your desired order fulfillment. And you don't have to power the whole system at once. And what that really gives you is an unmatched scalability. You can, if you don't want to start with big project, you can start with a small initial investment and scale your system as you grow in business 
and add more robots in the future. And that also gives you an improved reliability where you don't have downtime of your lanes and lines and conveyors. If something stops, if a vehicle stops, you bench it, you put it on the side and you let other robots take over. And what that all gives you is a one to two year payback period. And you can also, if, if you do it right, you, do, you, you can do less than that. And I will pass the mic for Derek here. Talk about Thank justifications. You Joe. I told Joe not to promise one to two years, but he said he really wanted to do sure. that. So, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just was going to talk about uh, justifying the system, and uh, really, it, it's taking advantage of the benefits that that Joe had mentioned uh, previously. Uh, usually the biggest uh, part of the justification comes with the improved productivity. So this is labor savings. This is the easy one to calculate uh, in terms of uh, showing a hard number on that. And it usually populates the uh, first figure in uh, return calculation. Uh, but we're all, as Joe also mentioned, there's a lot of space savings. Uh, that one site, uh, that application that Kevin had shown, for example, allowed them to uh, forego a move out of their facility uh, because the, the newer system was so compact that uh, they could stay in their current facility. So their rent of uh, in the increased space has gone down, but also the, to prevent the cost of having to move, which is a, a very large cost for them, uh, especially with all the uh, other equipment that they had in their facility. Uh, we get a, also an improved accuracy. You're bringing uh, typically goods to a person or to a robot, uh, for example, or a robot to the goods. It doesn't make the mistakes that a person might make uh, that's free to uh, travel through a warehouse, possibly picking the wrong item, the wrong quantities. Uh, the, the, these types of systems have a, a very improved uh, accuracy. Uh, you also see an improvement in the um, inventory control. Uh, you're not exposing the product uh, to all pickers. You're only exposing that product uh, to the person or the robot when it's needed. And you can also have a tighter control over that area because uh, it's not as, as widespread as a typical warehouse. You can improve cameras, scanning operations, or weighing operations at the time of picking to help reduce uh, theft or loss or other damage. And then finally, ergonomics. There's um, there's a, a very good case for this in some of our customers where they see a lot of uh, workers' compensation claims due to picking heavy items, for example, or repetitive nature of even a, a small pick uh, can be prevented with the, this type of application. So this is an example uh, calculation that in actually incorporated all of those returns from one of our customers here. It was about an $8 million investment and uh, they realized about a two, almost a three million uh, per year savings on it. Uh, so we got a payback of less than three years for this customer, not the one to two. This was an $8 million investment, but uh, as, you, as Joe mentioned, you could have, we could have had a scaled back investment, uh, but uh, this is a, a very typical one for us that we've seen just recently. And it also produced a 20% internal rate of return for them. So, these are the, the typical calculations that, um, that we would help you with to uh, evaluate an application. So uh, because each of these uh, applications are unique, we highly recommend uh, that you engage with an engineering study, either with uh, someone like Bastion, uh, our Bastion ourselves, we're obviously available. We, we do this quite often. Uh, really what we do is we look at your your data, we grab a lot, of, uh, a lot of information and data from you to uh, look at the trends, the seasonality, uh, look at the future, what are your projections for growth. Um, also review your current operation, the process that you're going through. Uh, we help select the right technologies because there are quite a few out there and not one, it's not one size fits all obviously. Um, and then we uh, also produce a budget cost and do return on investment analysis. 
And I'm going to pass it back to Joe, who's going to wrap us up with uh, what we think may be coming also in the future. Yeah, so for the industry outlook, what we're trying to look at is how we can make the material that our, we're building the robots with lighter weight so we can improve the efficiency of our systems. At the same time, we also we need to figure out how to make your servos lighter, your mobile robots lighter, your arms lighter. Because most of these um, robotic arms, for example, are designed to be stationary. And so once you put them on a vehicle, you're trying to capture as much energy as possible and save it, then you need to rethink twice about using one. And so material is a huge important factor right now. You also need to improve how these robots can work with humans and as well as interact with people. And there's nothing like having a robot that walks or that drives around your warehouse. It can recognize who you are by name. It can salute you. They can tell you how their weekend was, how busy they were, and report any problem in their warehouse. So with that, I conclude our presentation. And please uh, visit us at our booth. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you.